talk about geopolitics a little bit because I'm thinking, well, you're a little bit of a harbinger of, of doom on, on climate or whatever, related to science, uh, natural cycles, uh, but geopolitics. Are you watching what's happening in Ukraine and, and Russia? Did you anticipate that? Is that having a big effect? I didn't anticipate Ukraine. Nobody can anticipate any one country. I did anticipate geopolitical problems, yes. In my initial research, going back 15 years, uh, 13, 15 years ago, uh, uh, like I have a big long formula where you plug in these numbers, whether it be climate change, geopolitical, or whatever, uh, economic uh, differences and uh, countries opting in and out of free trade and uh, becoming more uh, blocks to themselves. And so, and so on, and uh, so I did anticipate geopolitical change, but they, did I give it that much weight? Uh, most of it, yes. Do you think the agricultural production in Ukraine being threatened now, and perhaps a very long time in the in the future, uh, you know, Eastern Ukraine is the most mined place on planet Earth now. It's very tough to farm there. It's very tough to get product out be very tough to get supplied is that is that factor into your formula well it definitely does yes uh that's uh, one component uh and that can't uh, be corrected that easily even if if uh they settle the war today let's say uh you got uh, five seven years before things can get back to anything that's considered normal uh, prior to the war. And that goes for Russia as well. And I don't think uh, commodities traders uh, in uh, agriculture uh, are giving it enough weight. Like who's fighting that war? Who's dying in that war? The Russians, where do those kids come from? They come from uh, farms and urban er and uh, other uh, country areas. Uh, you know, and uh, what were they? Yeah, they, they were helpers and they were working in the farm fields and so on. If I took half of your workforce away, can you uh, do that, produce as much as you do, or can you farm as much as you're farming? No. So, so and uh, never mind uh, Ukraine, that's uh, where their farm fields are mined and uh, the ports are mined and uh, the, the whole infrastructure is destroyed. So, yes, uh, uh, it'll have a big effect on world production, as will the climate change. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not just a restructuring of the production. I think it's a restructuring of, of the flow of output as well, as we see this division sort of between, you know, the West and, and what's becoming bricks and a whole different emerging uh, alliance. It's well, really that's the whole the thing now. You're dismantling everything, the whole entire supply chain from the raw products, commodities, to the finished goods. That includes our uh, transportation systems and uh, how they, the whole thing was designed to, to transport goods from point A to point B. Now, that no longer works if somebody else is the supplier. So what you're going to have now, you have the breakdown of the global trade and you're going to have the blocks, trading blocks. Uh, U.S., Canada, Australia, uh, Europe, and so on. Uh, and then you're going to have the other blocks, China. Uh, I don't know where India falls, but uh, you're going to have China, Russia, Brazil, and a bunch of other ones on the other side. But the, the whole supply chain has to be changed. And, that, that, and that's why I say there's so many problems, 50 problems to correct that, as opposed to prior recessions where you had uh, four, five, six problems to correct, and we're back to normal. That's why we won't be back to normal for uh, dozens of years. Well, that's, that's why I wonder, haven't we won the lottery uh, Robert, you by getting across the border and getting to Canada, me being born on the Manitoba Saskatchewan border, where you know we're going to be one of the beneficiaries of climate change, where we got a relatively robust banking system, we got all the infrastructure to transport things out, we got folks we can bring into the country to help, we've got great technology, 
here and we can produce and we're an island. North America is an island unto itself. I mean, aren't we, didn't we get the best of all worlds here? Well, if I had to pick some place in the world, <laughs> I would go anywhere else. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah. So, uh, Let's to say I agree with my dad's decision to choose that. <laughs> uh, Turned out good. Yes, and uh, like when I look at the other ones and uh, going back to uh, global disruption, like mm -hmm. you you look at uh, let's say uh, Germany for example, uh, the the gas uh, the the oil and uh, uh, gas being natural gas being shut off. That affects the whole manufacturing base. So you can't correct that. Who's going to make up the difference? You know, like that doesn't happen overnight. And then uh, China has got their real estate problems, huge real estate problems. Australia has the same thing. U.S. definitely. So now when you talk about that lag effect, of increased uh, of uh, the Fed increasing interest rates, and that we're just at the beginning of that uh, increase cycle uh, because of the lag effect of a year to two to two years, let's say. So not all mortgages in uh, like the commercial real estate mortgages come up for renewal, but let's say your mortgage comes up for renewal today. And you had a mortgage of three percent uh, from from way back. Now all of a sudden it's seven eight percent. You you can't increase rates. The other thing is uh, that you you got vacancy in there 30, 25, 30 percent vacancy. You so you don't even have enough to to service the other mortgage. Never mind the new one at uh, double and almost triple the rate. So, uh, but that's why I say the lag effect. It's not uh, just because they, they increase the interest rates. That doesn't mean the whole economy it get, gets the effect of it right away. It, it will be when everything resets. It has to reset on certain terms for everything renewal. Everything is resetting as we speak, but in uh, segments. Yeah. Like if your mortgage was five-year mortgage and expires this year, well, then you're on the hook for that. Now, uh, what's happening because of the COVID and uh, the work from home and everything else, that's the reason you have the 25, 30% vacancy in commercial real estate. And uh, that 25, 30% vacancy is a handicap already. That means when a landlord uh, has that like like you own that building, you have to take over all the common area costs. Common area costs being uh, uh, taxes, real estate taxes, the, all the uh, main, uh, common areas inside, storm removal, uh, lawn maintenance, roof repairs, the, everything else that would go to somebody else, unless I come back to you. At 30% is a lot. I've done some calculations and in uh, worst case scenarios, even if you have a building that's clear title, you don't know anything on it. The common area cost, you taking back all those common area costs with the vacancy and everything else will put you under. <laughs> that's a spooky prospect. If you own it and can't keep it. Well, that's what's coming down the pipe. Like I can't do... now. All that being said, every, uh, people think I'm negative. Uh, I've grown the most during recessionary times. That's when I took over the Winnipeg industrial uh, field and uh, grown the most in a, uh, during uh, other periods like the 90s and so on. So there'll be great opportunities. Yeah. Well, let's touch on some of the, the policy. That. You know, I think you're pretty in tune with some of the policy and we'll get we'll get into that. <laughs> but if you're Germany and you've got to choose between fertilizer production and heating your home because the Russians are shutting off the tap, but you're a dreamer and you know you gotta save the world because you got environmentalists that are picketing outside your window. 
but 85% of the wor world's energy still comes from, from coal and all that, and these technologies can't necessarily keep up. Isn't that adding fuel to the fire just because you want to have solar and wind power and feel we, good about all that? We definitely didn't think that whole uh, energy issue through clearly uh, uh, because before <laughs> you shut the tap off on something, and if you needed that to begin with, you have to figure out what you're going to replace it with. And we have not done <laughs> yeah. I we're agree. in la, la land as far as that's all concerned. But we're well, unfortunately, I, I think it hurts. And we're mm -hmm. being forced to go back to the dirtiest energy instead of being uh, at least like, let's say, if we would have made the provisions and uh, natural gas, at least, which is a little cleaner. Like you do it in incremental portions. You don't do it all of a sudden without having a replacement. Mm. For it, so uh, yes, uh, that's why Germany is paying a very high price, and uh, no, no LNG is going to replace it. Number one, cost, the the the, the shipping routes and uh, everything else. Uh, where it's, where does it originate from? How does it get there? The ports, can they handle it? And so on. It, they can't. They're not ready for it. I have heard from a friend who works at Manitoba Hydro. Well, number one, there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure in this province that needs to be upgraded and replaced to, you know, facilitate more energy, and it's just it's just not there. Um, and that dictates how much uh, can be exported and obviously the overall <laughs> price, supply and demand. But number two, I also heard an interesting thing that he said that Saskatchewan's bringing back in nuclear. I think that's an interesting sea change. Well, if we, the whole world would have looked at it that way, uh, I'd say nuclear would be the most logical and uh, cleanest replacement. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, like we did those uh, converter stations where the power comes from, let's say, from the uh, power station to the, uh, it's uh, transported, uh, I think, direct current, uh, and then it's uh, converted into uh, the other one, uh, uh, alternating current and so on before it can be used. So we did those converter stations and I know those uh, uh, they, the components, they took years to get manufactured and everything. So we only have X amount of cushion like, like uh, to even take care of the EV electric vehicles to plug in and everything. Uh, we don't have much surplus there. So he's right, absolutely. I agree with him hundred percent. That uh, well, I was I was much. listening to uh, I was listening to Donald Trump talk about how uh, they want to make electric tanks, and he said, "Can you imagine? We're going to go over these countries and electric tanks, and we're going to blow the shit out of everybody, but at least we'll be environmentally friendly." I mean, this is the kind of sentiment that's affecting perhaps common sense that uh, it almost it almost seems absurd, and this is. You you were taught you sent me an email with your take on environmental social governance and for those of us who are you know flogging an environmentally friendly fertilizer you know we're excited about the future being greener in a common sense fashion but what you're talking about with ESG what's in Europe and what's coming here it is a frightening Orwellian type of future is it not? Well, uh, again, uh, they're looking at uh, from a point of view uh, just. Uh, ideology with no idea how to keep the economy or anything running. Again, they'll do the same thing what uh, happened with the oil and gas industry if we let them. Well, there's very little money being invested by the institutions and so on into uh, oil and gas companies and, and uh, is being diverted elsewhere, and there, there's very little drilling going on. So ultimately, uh, it's a uh, it's a dwindling resource that isn't being replaced, and yet the demand is all there and growing. Okay, so how do you justify the two? Well, hopefully that's uh, bullish for commodities. But you're talking to a lender in Europe who's saying there's activists picketing outside their window and if you're saying here it's almost like a, it could be a social credit system whereby 
if you don't if you haven't filled out the proper forms and if you're not you know proving your carbon footprint and you're not doing this and the, that yada 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 you might not get financing and i already know for a fact that lenders are starting to like we have a program with fcc three-year financing our input because it's you know ca carbon carbon footprint friendly that's great but if it becomes a limiting factor to 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 get lending or a, a restriction of capital uh based on that um where is that going well, you will have to comply as the in industry, ag the entire agriculture industry, it doesn't matter whether it's agriculture or uh, uh, commercial real estate, uh, they're already trying to uh, make the buildings all economic, like uh, eco-friendly and uh, with the right amount of insulation, right uh, windows, right this, that. Uh, so it's all going that route. And the trouble is, like these companies, uh, the lenders, sorry, uh, they don't want to go on the limb. They want to uh, comply as much as they can. They don't want those protesters outside their buildings and uh, protesting that you funded a company X, Y, Z that uh, is doing some economic, uh, sorry, uh, uh some of that uh, environmental damage or something. Yeah. So they don't want to be associated with them. So that's why they want to take off their little boxes. Well, you, you've done this right. You've done that right. You got your loan. You didn't do it. Well, can you do it? Or can you correct it or so before we fund it? Yes, it's going there. Given that it's cyclical, though, and, and people will want to implement these policies, but I think we've seen in the net effect in Canada... I mean, if you're a single mother on fixed income, that's who's really getting hurt. That's who, who can't afford groceries. And you go to the grocery store, you know what I've heard? They don't even stop people stealing groceries anymore right now because it's dangerous because people can't afford the food. And uh, will that not create a sea change in, in politics and perception where it goes back the other way? Or how do you see, is it cyclical with people like, like, like the sun or how does that work? Well, it may slow it down, but I don't think it'll uh, change it. The environmental movement is just too strong, and they don't pay attention enough to the consequences or uh, solutions. Uh, they don't think it through completely. If they did, they never would have done to the oil gas industry what they're doing. We're on a slippery slope down with the oil and gas. I can easily see once the economies pick up again and it's everything else like years down the road, three, four, five years down the road, $150, $200 uh, oil. Are you then bearish on commodities still? I just talked to an analysis that was uh, got some downside targets for, for most stuff on, on the last podcast. Isn't this all really bullish for commodity prices, and don't we stand to benefit? Well, it's a supply and demand issue. If your demand is going up still, and there are no supplies being added, I'm talking oil and gas and so on, well, three guesses where the price goes. Yeah. Because your demand's going up. It is still going up, even in uh, today, right now. And yet uh, there's no new fields being produced. And that goes for most commodities. doesn't matter whether it's steel, aluminum, uh, copper, uh, nickel, whatever. See, the whole supply chain has been destroyed. Like at one time, we used to have Russia as a main supplier of commodities. When they used to trade commodities and everything else, a lot of stuff came from Russia, uh, South America, and uh, the rest of the world. But uh, Russia was a big supplier. Okay, so they sold us cheap commodities, raw commodities. They went to China. China refined them and finished them, and we got the finished goods from them on the cheap again. And they sold it to the rest of the world. That's what it kept our inflation down. But now all that supply is, chain is broken. And yeah. we have to replace it. And you do not replace that in one year, two years, or five years. It took us 20, 30 years, or, well, since the Second World War, to get to where we're at. But that was all broken, and 
2000, 2020, sorry. Yep. I don't really see you as being a negative individual. I've seen you as someone who's done the science, who's looked at the research, and, and you're a realist. What do you think is going to be the big opportunities, both in you know conventional production, but also we talk about ESGs and carbon credits and stuff like that. How are you? There must be some opportunities in there for people that, hey, they love, they love all this so much, you're going to get paid for it. Well, there'll be a lot of opportunities in, uh, let's say, carbon credits and so on. Once we come to grips with quantify and verify what your carbon footprint is. I'm talking in agriculture, especially. Yeah. Okay. So we can sell carbon credits to the rest of the industry. So yes, you can benefit that way. You know, there'll be huge, uh, there'll be, will be the, uh, input, uh, sorry repatriating industries mm. so in other words they're already doing it today uh let's say uh most of the i used to invest in the taiwan semiconductor uh they produce most of the chips yeah. out of taiwan and now they're being uh, repatriated back into usa so yeah. but what, what's that gonna do that's why i say it's gonna take us years to to uh muddle through all this and correct these problems because what, what do you have you 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 have to put new equipment in new buildings yes you will get technology and get some uh cost cutting from the robotics the artificial intelligence and everything else that goes into it but you still need people do we have the trained workforce no we don't anymore do, uh, uh, what's the workforce going to look like what are they going to get paid? Yeah, they'll get three, four, five times more than they got back uh, in other countries. Therefore, inflation and so on. So it'll take us a long time to get uh, and bundle through all this because there's such major structural changes. I wonder, do you see as an opportunity that uh, some of the, you know, Hewer, hewing of wood and hauling of water and you know you even talk about these semiconductors and stuff is getting repatriated is it is it a lot of opportunity out there that it's coming back home and we need to supply ourselves and the world has changed yes but uh is the public ready to pay the price in inflation yeah. for those products being made locally rather than uh, sourced from uh, other countries that's the, the what we have to deal with, and we got really don't have any choice because uh, wh what we've been uh, already, what we've already learned, is that uh, we have to uh, make more, uh, more products locally, uh, and uh, uh, no matter what the cost is, if you want the product. Don't you think, though, that uh, technology and, and robotics and automation, artificial intelligence, replacing over time a lot of things that human beings used to be able to do, uh, being able to do these things better, um, won't that create an abundance in goods and services like we've never seen before that we, we can't imagine and people might just be bored and wonder what their purpose is because they don't point. have anything to do? To a point. You, know? you yeah. still need people. And yeah. you still... Uh... And it's a huge capital outlay, huge. Not just buildings, but equipment and so on. Number one, and the other number, like we talked about Germany and uh, them not being able to supply the finished goods that uh, manufactured goods that they were doing. Most of that equipment comes from the Germany and Japan and uh, the rest of the world. They yeah. can't even, who's gonna supply that equipment? They can't do it anymore since they're, uh, uh, gas and oil supplies are cut off. Is there then a market that you're potentially looking at back, going back into or going into a new market, Robert, with the coming, you know, rep rep uh, recession, depression slash opportunity? Well, there'll be a tremendous, uh, like anybody that figures out what to do with the existing buildings that are going to be empty. There will be buildings that will be empty and have, have to be bulldozed commercial real estate I'm talking about uh, throughout U.S. and Canada. Okay, so so what uh, what do you do with them? Uh, is uh, Are you going to put the residential 
like a lot of people talk about uh, taking those uh, office buildings, converting them into uh, residential. Well, they've never done a building, never converted a building. Because uh, number one, like where's your sewer water? Where, where like, uh, how do you service all that? There's different needs for it. Uh, what are your fire escapes like? You know, uh, and uh, firewalls and the rest, uh, the sprinkler sh systems and everything uh, comes together. Everything's done wrong. I've tried to convert buildings uh, lots of times because sometimes I bought land like, let's say, Labatt site in Winnipeg. That was 32 acres. Uh, and they, they had new buildings that were 10 years old only. And I tried to incorporate them into something. Couldn't do it. Ended up demolishing it. Well, I didn't demolish it. Labatt's did. Uh, but uh, they ended up demolishing everything and uh, starting from scratch because you didn't have the right loading area. You had the right uh, car parking areas, right, uh, you couldn't locate buildings at the right locations and everything. So that same thing is going to apply, my guess is, to commercial real estate. There'll be some attempts to convert them, but they, they, it's very, very difficult. Anybody that's done a building will tell you that. Interesting. Well, you alluded to the fact that workers aren't going back to work. Uh, and that was obviously a result of uh, the COVID shutdown around the world. How did how did that whole time in our history, which uh, has aged in a very interesting way, let's say, how did how did COVID factor into your complex calculations for the future there? How did you, how did you uh, view COVID that? COVID actually didn't. Uh, I knew we were ready for a, a pandemic because the last one, I think, was the Spanish flu and stuff like that. Uh, that goes back a long way. Uh, so I knew we were ready for it, but uh, I didn't know the effects. I never anticipated that not going back to work. That. Uh, I thought it would be a, yes, for for time being, you wouldn't go, but then, then you'd go back. But then right now, the way it looks, one third of the workforce will not go back. They'd rather well, it's change. reshaped yeah. people's behavior so much. And the fascinating thing was how, how people spent during it. Um, it seemed like everybody went on a bit of a spending spree, changed their behavior. You know, now things are back to normal and we don't really think about it as much, but uh, maybe it accelerated some of the coming changes. Um, well, what happened, of course, the governments gave out a lot of money. Uh, they printed a lot of money and they gave out a lot of money and general public, and we're still cruising on that. It's kicking the can down the road, isn't it? I mean, when you can yeah. only run the American government for another four, 45 days before you have another kind of showdown. Well, that's uh, a different scary stuff, eh? Kind of worms. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But what I'm getting at, all the money that they spend during COVID, giving it to, to the public and distribute, redistributing all the money, printing and everything, we're still cruising on that. Ultimately, that'll come to an end. And that's when I anticipate the recession kicking in. And uh, uh, first of all, it's I don't know what the trigger mechanism could will be. It could be uh, commercial real estate, let's say. Right now, commercial real estate is affecting China real, in a real bad way. Uh, and again, like I alluded before, this Australia is a similar boat, uh, U.S. definitely. And uh, commercial real estate will take down a lot of U.S. regional banks. They're insolvent. They don't want the, the public to know that. Of course, because uh, they don't want to run on the banks, but they are basically insolvent. Because when I look at it and I talk to my friends in, uh, it doesn't matter where, San Francisco, uh, Atlanta, or U uh, New York, or wherever, uh, those uh, buildings, uh, let's say uh, a building is worth a million dollars, just numbers. Uh, the guy was able to get a $750,000 mortgage on it. Uh, now with the, the vacancy rate in there and everything, that building's worth only 600000 
So, so uh, the investor lost all his capital that he put in and even the lenders losing. And that's the case with very large amount of office space, mostly class B and C and the lower uh, space. Class A is a little different in that it'll be affected, but nowhere near to the degree of class B, C and D and so on space. Well, I don't think, uh, to tell you the truth, they're all going to take a haircut, but our banks are a little different. <laughs> well, no, no question. They're all invested yeah. in commercial real estate. Uh, yeah. and, and that's where, you know, when I used to take my trips to Toronto and for past, uh, what, 12 years now, 13 years, I've been talking and meeting with them and telling them the difference, showing them the difference between commercial real estate and agriculture agriculture as a whole doesn't matter value added included and everything from a, uh, from pro producer level right up to the value added finished good level where it's a lot different and uh, they are uh, like right now a lot of banks uh, are looking to what is the safest haven agriculture is it the only thing is that agriculture is nowhere near sophisticated or is advanced from an investor's point of view. There's no vehicles of investment, like there's no REITs. Like commercial mm. real estate is REITs. It has all kinds of different uh, uh, investment vehicles where agriculture doesn't. That's the problem with it uh, at this stage. But doesn't that speak to the fundamental argument of the, the fellow on the internet who, who's, I think, more or less a detractor of having outside investors like yourself drive up farmland so oh, you their have son... To. Otherwise, uh, uh, no capital, There's a, nobody is going to get it. See, what I'm afraid of, what uh, no, nobody's really addressing at this stage, let's take the U.S. as an example the uh, the regional banks and so on they're going to have problems now they have to recapitalize they have to re uh, because to, to meet the banking regulations it's usually a 10 to 1 ratio one dollar that comes in as a deposit they can then lend that out yeah so now when they get, get those bankruptcies failures and so on that'll deteriorate their capital uh, capital base they'll have to recapitalize the only way they can recapitalize is either through uh, uh, through deposits, new deposits, or uh, some other form, lend less and so on. Mm -hmm. So now they're going to stop lending. That's coming down the road next. So everybody thinks, well, the, their interest rates are going to go down and this and that. And then they figure, well, things will be back to normal. No, they won't be. Interest rates could go back to zero. But if capital is not available, you're not going anywhere. Wouldn't yeah. agriculture be one of the safe havens for, for lending? Again, given this agri I'm not talking, I'm talking the rest of the economy. Yeah. Agriculture is yeah. definitely on its own with a preferred uh uh, investment view by the rest of the the, the lenders. Agriculture is yeah. not included. Yeah, they will be. It will be included, uh, not totally, uh, but uh, it, uh, it will be included in. Let's say they'll want more. Uh, they'll want more collateral or something, a little bit more, because they once they get burned so much on the other end, they always tightening up the regulations a little. So they'll want more collateral, you to pledge more collateral, and they, instead of going 75%, uh, they, they go 70%, let's say, or something. Would you come in a little bit more, pledge more collateral to them? But in US, those loans won't be available at all, especially when, it, when you're talking the commercial real estate. It'll be good to have cash then, except well, if it's in a bank that goes cash, broke. It will be good to be innovative and give, and, uh, uh, like with my knowledge of uh, industrial buildings and, well, we were in everything, uh, office, industrial, 
retail, all kinds of stuff. So I, I know them all, how to convert them and make them useful again. Won't the governments just step in and print more money like every time in the past and kick the can down the road? Or are we running out of that option? <laughs> running out of those options. Yeah. I thought, uh, I thought uh, that would come to an end a while back. I didn't think they could even go this far. But uh, right now, what's happening, it's, uh, I'd say, USA, uh, is the cleanest dirty shirt. Okay, so you can uh, Chinese investors, uh, uh, big guys with money, they're, they're looking at, well, China's having a problem, maybe we'll, again, they go to U.S., it's winning by default. It's not winning because it is the best solution. So uh, a lot of money is coming into U.S. from the rest of the world because of the rest of the world has even bigger problems. Hmm. If I had to say like uh, Canada and U.S., they're about the least problems. The best place and, uh, to be. And the uh, rest of the world still feels it's a safe haven. What is going to happen with farmland? I mean, 17% increase? Uh, yeah, where boggles. are you at? How far are you from, uh, let's say, Alberta that's at six, 7,000? I think you still have price. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. and uh, like I said, I do equal production. If they do 50 bushel per acre canola, they get the same price. The only difference might be a little bit of uh, uh, of uh, shipping costs. Are you going to be able to buy land and, and remediate it like we have been doing in the past, do you think? Are you going to be able to push trees and, and drain? Well, see, and... Uh, I'm not in a business. Everybody thinks, well, we're removing all the trees uh, just to gain land. No, that's not true because uh, it costs me more money to gain that two acres then I could buy. I could buy a, uh, like a two acres uh, to quarter section, 160 acres, so the 80 times. Uh, I could buy that quarter section, uh, 160 acres cheaper than for me to reclaim 160 acres. It'll cost really? me twice as much. The, the idea is efficiency. So uh, when I remove those uh, 10 two acre bluffs, that, that hundred foot cedars don't have to go snake through all that stuff. They can go straight back and forth and get some efficiency. Yeah. So what we have is uh, I have la other land, let's say a hundred uh, foot a section, and then uh, 140 is uh, cultivated. That we can we'll let it grow back into poplars and everything else to offset that what we cleared. So we're doing hmm. offsets already. Yeah. Where do you see regenerative and organic agriculture fitting in? Well, it has a place, but a niche place. It's not going to feed the world, okay? Yeah. Like uh, you have to, in order to be, uh, to feed the world, you have to be as efficient as you can be. And uh, Canada definitely on the right track for that. I don't think anybody in the world can beat us. All we have to Good do to is uh, keep the capital coming in, investing prop into the uh, re equipment, the best equipment possible, because we have the young entrepreneurs coming up that, they, that uh, have the global picture and that can produce and compete globally. I always think it's really interesting, you as a group with 30, 231,000 acres, that's a lot of buying power. That's a lot of opportunity to deploy technology. That's a lot of opportunity to put people's noggins in. So have you thought about a, like a peer group, a, a buying group, a, a deploying technologies or products hint, hint, you know, across the whole whole acreage? Is that, or is everybody a, a kind of a lone wolf? Well, when like we're maybe 231,000, but we let, uh, rent land to by the 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 max, you know? Yeah. So uh, all the big producers, they may rent uh, 5,000 acres from us, 
but they have 25 30,000 of their own so they right. uh, so we're not a united like somebody that can uh, move the needle because of volume we have lots but we don't uh, have it under production under one control you know like the different producers and that they depend on us like they have the equipment and they need that 5,000 acres from us to fully utilize that equipment on the 35,000. If I take 5,000 acres from them, they got, they're they over-equipped. Right. So uh, we work together already, but in different segments with different producers. And a lot of our land is under uh, uh, research and so on for different purposes and uh, testing different equipment as because of all those uh, producers that rent from us are in those programs. Doesn't matter whether it's the latest equipment uh, uh, from John Deere, uh, New Holland, or Case, or whoever. Actually, all of them are working uh, with uh, different tenants. You have a criteria for land. What is your criteria for for tenants and, and working with folks? Well, oh, that just is complicated. <laughs> because, uh, you need a like-minded thinking individual that wants to be progressive and that believes in uh, the latest technology and uh, because the latest technology will uh, take us a long way towards those ESG standards, carbon footprint, uh, uh, lesser the carbon footprint and uh, be able to sell carbon credits and everything else. So uh, that is a uh, very strong uh, criteria. And uh, uh, but, but I'm happy to say again that there's a lot of people that fill the bill with the upcoming young guys that uh, young entrepreneurs. Yeah, beyond, you know, the joy of owning land, um... It must be a great joy working with with other Absolutely. entrepreneurs. Absolutely, that is the best. Yeah, actually, I don't even think about owning land as a joy. I kind of think of it. I think of the tenants as the joy of working with them and taking it to the next step and so on. Yeah, and making you... them as profitable and uh, as they can be. Yep, yep. What do you think is the biggest misconception about? yourself and your company and what you do uh, in the agricultural community out there? Misconception? Yep. Oh, the fact that we uh, can control the market or something like that, or the fact that, uh, uh, like what we're doing, clearing land and that, that it's all detrimental. Uh, like they missed the whole, all the whole point. Okay, if I clear that land the way I say, and you get a full section, one mile by one mile square, you still have those uh, north-south uh, corridors, the uh, uh, roads, uh, or what they call that. Uh, well, roads, uh, like you, you have- Road allowances? Uh, road allowances, right, right. That's what the word I was looking for. Yeah, you yep. still have road allowances north, south, east, and west that circle that full section. But if you clear that section, I easily get anywhere from 30 to up to 80% efficiency. So in other words, they can spend half the time seeding that section as they would before we cleared it uh, 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 of those uh, buried the rock piles, removed the fences and everything else. Okay, so how what do you have? You have it. You have uh, let's say uh, uh, harrowing, seeding, three times uh, uh, sprayers uh, for different purposes, swathing and combining seven times a year. You duplicate that. That you say right. you can save fifty percent and do fifty percent more, so that means I use fifty percent less carbon footprint. Interesting. Because the tractors aren't running that uh, uh, amount of time, or they're doing that much more. So what does that say? 
you got such a small window of opportunity for seating and uh, doing the actual work. If you take the reins out and when it's wet and ev everything else, that if you can do twice as much in those two, three weeks, why not? Especially when I offset that by letting it grow into a forest and so on on my other land, because we have 40,000 acres of creeks, uh, bush, uh, different uh, native grass, all kinds of different things. It's green space. So we offset it, but nobody gives me credit for that. Nobody looks at it. That's Nor kind of what drives me nuts about this whole I... thing. It, it, it's, it's, it's a perception thing, but is it, wouldn't there be a great argument to make if we can make our arable land much more efficient? Then we, we don't have to put this marginal land in production, pour the coal to it, we don't have to burn down the rainforest. I mean, using good arable land as effective as possible, isn't that an environmental strategy? Okay, look at your whole picture. That's another thing that the environmentalists miss totally. Canada is, has a very large land base, number two in the world, as far as countries are concerned. Russia is number one. Okay, we we got number two, uh, second largest land base. Of that, four point five percent is only is arable land. That's it. So in Canada, sorry, you said, or in Russia? Canada, yes. In Canada, okay. Wow. Yeah. 4.5%. That's all you're working with. And what is it in Russia? Do you know? Seems like well, it'd be a lower percentage even because it's larger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not, uh, they have a much larger. I think Canada is one of the lowest arable oh, really? land to total land mass. India is number one. And then uh, they go uh, U.S., China, and so on. And uh, I don't brush us amongst the top four. Where they, they they have 17, 20 percent and so on. So so what I'm saying, you got 4.5 percent. So you want to sacrifice that 4.5 percent yet? You got nothing right. left. Yeah. So I want to make the best I can that 4.5 percent, and make it as productive as I can. That's all you got to work with. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, when you get perspective on on how much carbon's probably captured in in Canada by virtue of all of our our trees and and natural we're, forests we're and everything. We're in a surplus position. We can sell carbon yeah. from the to the rest of the world from our boreal forests and everything else. The rest of the world doesn't come close. Yeah. I often wonder if our time wouldn't be better spent trying to convince those amongst us on the planet that, that are polluting more proportionally somehow to help them, you know, transform that um, more than worry about well, our own. I found a lot of these uh, movements, uh, whether it's far right or far left, facts don't matter. <laughs> Just so emotion. They don't want to spend time listening to facts or data or whatever. They, they have a preconceived motion notion that they want to go with and that's what they go with because these well, facts I believe are that technology is let's face it i don't uh, pull these things out of my the hat and uh quote them <laughs> look them up on google they're right there well it seems as though technology too with social media and whatnot has certainly increased the level of polarization and, and obviously you just get you just get farther and farther apart that is definitely true.